Well, could I uh, invite you to reach for a Bible and turn to Luke chapter 5? Luke chapter 5. If you're using the Pew Bibles, it's page 1032. And we're reading the first 11 verses together. It would be really helpful to me if you have this text in front of you. As we make our way through it in in, in the sermon, we're going to follow through it in detail. Uh, So it's helpful to have it in front of you. It's also helpful to have the text in front of you in case I talk nonsense about it. And you can look at it and say, that's not what the text says. So you need to hold me to account and have the text in front of you. So Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding round him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they'd done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, they left everything, and followed him. Amen. We know this to be true. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you for the the reading of your word. We ask that you would bless us now, by and through the ministry of your Holy Spirit, who will reveal your word to us, and grant us the vision that we do not have of ourselves. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I've been told uh, that my uh, singing career in the pulpit has peaked with the Rocky theme tune, that, that I'm not to try and better it. So I'm not going to sing, but I'm going to quote some lyrics. And I wonder how quickly you'll recognize this song and singer. And if you recognize it, feel free to, to shout out. You ready? I've been a puppet, a pauper, a pirate, a poet, a pawn and a king. I've been up and down and over and out, and I know one thing. Does nobody know this? Say it again. Sinatra. Anyone know the name of the... Do you know the name of the song? I'll keep going. Each time I find myself flat on my face, I pick myself up and get back in the race. No, not my way. That's life. Did you say, who said my... That's life. That's what all the people say. Riding high in April, shot down in May, back on top in in June. Sinatra, uh, that's life. It's a great song. It's a good reminder uh, that not many of us, if any of us at all, will go through life on a steady level of success. But rather the song talks about a series of ups and downs, highs and lows, successes and failures, things we're proud of, things we might not be proud of. And what I want to say this morning is that the Christian journey is no different to that. The Christian journey is full of ups and downs, successes and failures. And if we take a look at the lives of some of the disciples or the apostles in the Gospels, uh, we will see very clearly this series of ups and downs in their life Uh, successes and failures, falls and restorations. Uh, And what I want to encourage us this morning is whenever we read the 
imperfection of these great men of God, that it should resonate with us as followers of Jesus ourselves. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look between now and the new year. We're going to take a look at one apostle in particular, the apostle Peter. And we're going to track particularly the ups and downs of his discipleship and uh, and, and especially how the Lord can use him through those series of life's events. So we're going to start by taking a look at this narrative from Luke. Uh, Luke describes this event that captured Peter uh, as a disciple. And I was, I was, as I was looking at this text throughout the week, I was feeling particularly Presbyterian, and I've written a sermon around four points that all begin with the letter P. Um, so a four-point sermon, all beginning with P, that tracks the movement of Peter in response to Jesus in this text. So if you're taking notes, I know some of you take notes using the wee pages on the inside of the order of service. If you're taking notes, I'll give you the four points in advance so you can see where we're going. The four points are partial interest, practical obedience, penitent confession, and purposeful commitment. So with with Luke chapter 5 in front of us, let's look at Peter's partial interest, okay? Uh, It's worth noting that this text is not the first time that Peter encounters Jesus. In the chapter before, in Luke chapter 4, we read that Jesus is in a synagogue. He's preaching with authority. He's casting out demons. And and after that, he goes to Simon Peter's house, uh, where his mother-in-law has a high fever, and Jesus is asked to help. And Jesus rebukes the fever, and it leaves her. So, Uh, Peter is not unfamiliar with Jesus. Um, It's very possible that Peter was in the synagogue listening to him teach uh, and saw him cast out demons. It's very possible that Peter was with him after he healed his mother-in-law, where the text says that they brought everybody who was ill with fever and, and all sorts of illness, and Jesus healed them. He laid his hands on them and heals them. The Bible doesn't tell us, but we can probably think that that Peter was there. And so Peter was probably among this group of people who were paying uh, particular attention to the things that Jesus was saying and, and doing. He was close enough to Jesus to invite him back to his house. He was among the people uh, wanting to hear Jesus preach the word of God in verse one. And he was close enough to Jesus or Jesus knew him well enough to ask him for the lend of his boat. Okay, verse 3. Uh, Jesus got into one of the boats, and it was the boat that belonged to Simon Peter and asked him to row out a little from the shore. Okay, so, so no problem here. Peter uh, takes Jesus out a little bit into the lake, and at the end of verse 3, we have this picture where Jesus and Peter are in the boat. Jesus sits down to teach the crowd, Presumably, he's using the acoustics of the water uh, to project his voice so that the crowds will hear. So, so here's Peter. He's interested in Jesus. He's engaged with what he says. He's captivated by what Jesus is doing. But as we'll see through the progression of Luke's account, Peter isn't actually aware of who Jesus is yet. I don't know if you've ever heard someone say, Jesus was one of the great holy men of history. Or, or Jesus was, was one of the greatest teachers. Historians and academics and, uh, and journalists would have to say that about this historical man, Jesus of Nazareth, that he was one of the great holy men of history. Other religions and, and spiritual movements would say, uh, for example, Islam and Baha'i and Druze religions all consider Jesus to be Uh, a prophet, a great healer, a miracle worker, one of the spiritual examples to the world. One religion, uh, whose name I can't pronounce, considers Jesus as a prophet that has been sent by an extraterrestrial race. Religious science movement calls Jesus the teacher of the science of the mind. Politicians or sociologists might say Jesus was a revolutionary, he reshaped the world. He, he, he reshaped or shaped social behavior. And they have a partial interest in him. But they don't know who he actually is. I have friends who have become parents and they've said to me, well, we're not religious and we're not Christians and we have no interest in going to church. 
but we're going to send our children to church. We're going to send our children to, to Sunday school because we want them to learn good Christian morals. A partial interest in who Jesus is. It's possible to come to church, enjoy church culture, keep busy helping out at things with only a partial interest in who Jesus is. Peter is going to move uh, from a partial interest here. He's going to find out in this text who Jesus is. And by doing that, we move from partial interest to practical obedience. Um, Peter and, and, and Jesus are in the boat, verse 4. Uh, Jesus finishes preaching to the crowd. And instead of asking Peter to take him back to the shore, he says, uh, go out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, in verse 2, we read that the boats owned by fishermen were on the shore and their nets were being washed, which means that they had been recently used. They were being washed and, and put away. And, and, and this was one of those two boats. And Jesus suggests, let's, let's go out into the deep water and put the nets down again. Now, look at the pushback from Peter, a little pushback in verse 5. He says, Master, we, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. Okay, nighttime or darkness was the better time for catching fish in the deeper water. Any experienced fisherman knew that at the time. And, and here's a carpenter, now an itinerant preacher. He's telling an experienced fisherman how to fish. Okay, even though all the nets were, had been cleaned and put away for fishing again that night, presumably, Jesus asks for something inconvenient and something that doesn't make sense. So we see a little bit of pushback here, perhaps a little bit of frustration aimed at Jesus here. Jesus, th th those of us who know how to fish, who have already been out here at night time, the best conditions, and we didn't catch anything then. But look at verse 5 still, Peter says, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. And I wonder if when you read that, you recall a boss or someone in authority over you telling you to do something that you knew wasn't the right way to do it. And, and, and because he was your boss or because they had authority over you, you had to grit your teeth and do it their way, even though you knew better. And maybe you did it even hoping that it failed so you could prove that you were right. Maybe your parents forced you to do something their way, and when you challenged it and asked why, the answer was, because I say so. Which, by the way, since becoming a parent, I've learned is not only a legitimate answer, it's the default answer. Because I, the one with authority, say so. And you'll notice that Peter calls Jesus Master in verse 5. And there's no point in calling Jesus Master if you're not going to respect his authority. There's no point in calling Jesus Lord and not doing what he says. We read with the children, why do you, why, why, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I, not do what I say? This demands a question of us, doesn't it? Can Jesus tell me what to do? Does Jesus have authority in my life to tell me what to do? Does Jesus have the final say? And even if it doesn't make sense to me, even if I think I know better, can Jesus tell me what to do? And it's one thing to be obedient to Jesus when it makes sense or when it's easy or when it doesn't cost us anything, but it's another thing entirely to be obedient to Jesus when we don't understand why, when it's difficult or, or when it feels sacrificial, but just because he says it. Is Jesus speaking to you this morning when he says, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? He's speaking to me. 
And I don't really know what's going on through Peter's mind here in verse 5. No doubt it could have been frustration, it could have been smugness, it could have been reluctance, or it just could have been confusion. He could have been saying, what does this guy know about fishing to tell me what to do? But I wonder if you could read this this morning and determine that our response, that your response will be one of practical obedience. Jesus, it's a very strange thing for you to ask me to do that. It's a very strange thing to ask me to to stop doing that. And even though it goes across the grain of what I think, nonetheless, Lord, because you say so, I'll do it. Partial interest, practical obedience, and then we come to Peter's penitent confession. What happens when Peter goes against his own logic and obeys Jesus at his word? Look at verse 6 and 7. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. It's a reminder to us this morning, isn't it, that when we obey Jesus, he ends up accomplishing through us things that we could not have done ourselves. This is no natural catch of fish. It's why most Bibles give it the title, The Miraculous Catch. And a sermon for another day, not not this morning, but uh, don't read anything into that. Uh, (laughs) A, a, a sermon for another day might be uh, the things that we could achieve way beyond our own abilities when we allow Jesus to work through us. But we're not stopping there this morning. We'll keep going and follow the text and see how Peter reacts. Well, how, how would we react if we were Peter? If we were in, in the boat and, and, and witnessed what Peter just witnessed, how, how would we react? Would we say, Jesus, let's go into the fishing business together? We'll be rich in no time. Or we might say, Jesus, we'll give you 25% of the profits if you'll just come out here and do this once a week. Or at the very least, Jesus, would you teach us how to do that? Peter's reaction is very strange indeed. He doesn't celebrate the best catch of his career. He doesn't even seem to be happy about it. Most other fishermen would be boasting about this catch in the pub for the rest of their days, but but Peter does none of that. Look at verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, the catch of fish, he falls at Jesus' knees and says, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Do you know the feeling of being in the presence of someone who shows up all your flaws and feelings? Maybe you're in uni and you're chatting to one of your professors or you're in school and you're chatting to one of your teachers who is so smart and so knowledgeable that just talking to them, you realize how dumb you are. Or maybe you've had your photo taken beside someone who's stunningly beautiful or someone who's in impressive shape and you realize how much work you need to do. Maybe in the presence of someone who's very wealthy for whom money is no issue and just being in their presence you you realize just how little money you have in comparison. A friend of mine is a a, a sheep farmer. Uh, He he gave me a call. He was in Molusk with a trailer full of sheep and he was visiting a vet which is up near Molusk. Uh, And I said, well, look, if you're in Molusk, let's, let's meet for a cup of coffee. And he was very reluctant. He says, no, no, I'll not bother. I'm wearing my farming clothes. And I said, don't worry about that. How often are we in the same geographical location? Let's meet for coffee. So we agreed to meet in Bothy in in Molusk. And then he walked wearing waterproof dungarees and wellies that were splattered in who knows what. And as soon as I saw him walk into the coffee shop, I said, we've made a mistake here. We've made a mistake. Only then did I realize what farming clothes meant. And he was stinking. And by by association, I was stinking in comparison to everybody else in the coffee shop. We, We didn't feel comfortable at all. See, a contrast 
a contrast can make us very uncomfortable. A severe contrast can make us feel ashamed. And here is the greatest contrast imaginable because Peter suddenly realizes through this catch of fish that he's standing in the presence of holy God. He's in the boat with the holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. And he suddenly realizes this. You know that hymn we sang at the beginning, Holy, 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 it's based off Isaiah 6 and, and it's when the prophet Isaiah is, is, is taken up to the throne room of heaven and he sees the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, the train of his, his robe fills the temple and the angels that are in the Lord's presence have to hide their face from his glory and the angels sing to one another, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And the prophet Isaiah is responses is one of sorrow. He says, woe to me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the glory of God. See, the presence of the holy God highlighted Isaiah's sin, much like Adam and Eve in the garden when they, when they heard the Lord, and they, they hid from him because they were aware of their Sin And Peter, he has this exact same reaction. He finds himself standing next to God, the image of the invisible God, the, the holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. And we see that Peter is overcome with his own sinfulness. In contrast to who Jesus actually is. And it's interesting, isn't it, that it wasn't the teaching with authority in the synagogue. It wasn't the, the casting out of demons. It wasn't the, 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 the laying on of hands and, and healing. For Peter, it was a catch of fish that defied a fisherman's comprehension that made him realize he's in the presence of God. And he laments. He says, go away from me, for I am a sinful man. You know, the, the, the most repentant sinners are not the ones with the biggest sins, but the ones with the biggest view of God. Something I've discovered the longer I walk with God, it's not that I'm becoming less and less sinful. It's the more knowledge that I have of who God is, the more clarity that the Holy Spirit gives me about his holiness, as he becomes brighter and brighter, he becomes more holy and more holy, and in contrast, I become more and more aware of my sin, and the gap between me and a holy God widens, which makes the cross of Jesus Christ more and more beautiful as it bridges that gap. God's glory increases. The reality of our sinfulness increases. The beauty of Calvary, therefore, increases. And what Peter doesn't know yet, and we're going to see this journey of discovery as we make our way through the service, is that he's not only standing in the presence of the holy God who condemns him for his sin, he's standing in the presence of the Lamb of God who will take away his sin. So Jesus says, don't be afraid. And Jesus can say, don't be afraid, because he's in the presence of God, but it's Jesus who will enable him to be in the presence of God without condemnation. Our sin does not force us from the presence of God, and this is exactly the mission of Jesus, exactly why he came, to enable sinners like me and you to draw close to God in all his holiness. And Peter will learn that, and we'll look at that next week. So we've seen partial interest, practical obedience, penitent confession, and very quickly, as we finish, purposeful commitment. Verse 10 and 11, Jesus says to Peter, do not be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything and followed him. So here's Luke. He's uh, describing the event that led not just Peter, but also James and John uh, to leave behind their livelihood and radically change the trajectory of their lives. We read they pulled their boats up on the shore. They left everything, presumably including this, this, this huge haul of fish, and they followed Jesus. This is the opposite of partial interest. They now have purposeful commitment. They're not half in. 
They're not half out. They're not disciples of Jesus on the weekend. They're not even fishermen on the weekend because Peter recognizes who Jesus is and it radically changes his life. So, so, so th th this is not an instruction for us this morning to give up our vocation. Although depending on what your vocation is, you might need to change. But what this tells us at the very least as God's people this morning is to meet Jesus, to see him for who he is radically changes our life. So radical, the Bible calls it a new birth. We're born all over again. We, we, we have a new life that begins. We cannot acknowledge Jesus for who he is and remain the same. Our recognition of Jesus for who he actually is, it's not just a matter of fact. It's not just a matter of academic assumption. It's a matter of new purpose. It will, it will affect our day-to-day -day lives, every aspect of how we live. And if it doesn't, well, it's possible we haven't recognized him. So let's finish. Let's ask ourselves, are we partially interested in Jesus this morning? Or are we purposely committed to him? Let me pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word to us. We ask, Lord, that you by your Holy Spirit would speak. Lord, that we would hear what you would have to say to us. And Lord, that by your spirit, you would help us to do what you're asking us to do. Grant us a spirit of obedience. Grant us that spirit of awe in your presence. And grant us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we are not cast from your presence. But through him, we are drawn near. Help us to know that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.